Good afternoon and welcome. I am so glad to see so many people here so far. Um, I'd like to uh, just extend a really warm welcome to our students, alumni, faculty, and staff that have joined us. I personally have been looking forward to this conversation for the past couple of months, so I think we should get started. Um, first, let me introduce our distinguished guest, Shingy. He is an Australian futurist, speaker, creative director, strategic uh, digital consultant, and entrepreneur. He's known for his performative persona and his bold polarizing moniker, The Digital Prophet. He is a multi-dimensional creative who specializes in advising clients about inventive, effective, and sustainable approaches to optimizing brand value within the digital landscape. He is passionate about educating big brands about the unique opportunities afforded by emerging digital, social, and mobile technologies. He has been described as by Forbes as an artist, a globe-trotting speaker and market seeker. He's a storyteller who identifies emerging trends and inspires clients to think differently. Welcome to Newhouse, Shingy. We are thrilled to have you. Hey, Regina. What's cooking? I, <laughs> look, did I write that bio? It sounds a little... I think you did. <laughs> oh, so I apologize. <laughs> you sounded fabulous. We should just, you know, we should get this thing down to one sentence or three words or some shit like that. That's probably a little bit more appropriate for today. How are you? How's everything? I'm doing good. How are you? Uh, yeah, you know, I can't, I can't complain. It could be another 20 degrees warmer, but other than that, I'm all good. I agree. I agree. I see your little friend in the back there taking a nap. That's my rescue. Yeah, that's London. Aww. She's my little gray greyhound racer from Florida. I love it. I love yeah. it. Um, real quick, I know that Amanda just put in the uh, in the chat that if you have a question to just uh, put put it put it in there. This really is a question. This is a conversation with us and Shingy. And while I have some questions prepared, I really would love it if you guys would just uh, jump in and ask any kind of questions. So um, I'm going to lead off though. You know, in thinking about what I wanted to talk about today and doing a little bit of research, I came across a talk that you did in 2015. Mm, and, okay. <laughs> right? I know. It's true. And, I was there probably. Uh huh. Yeah. All right. Well, you said that communicators should stop using the word or the term storyteller. I can tell you personally, I use that in my classroom all the time. I tell my students, I teach PR students that we are the storytellers of brands, right? We are the conduit between an organization and a brand and the publics. So why should we move away from storyteller? Oh, wow. And You're just going to dive straight into being a contentious question. Gonna, uh, you yeah. know, I, I love the fact that firstly, we didn't talk about what questions are going to happen. So I'm totally yes. down for where you're going to take this. Here's <laughs> why. The problem, I don't get hooked up. I don't get hooked up on the word story. Love, 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 love story. I get really problematic with the word teller. Okay. And the problem with telling, particularly around 2015 to maybe 17 or 18, is the world shifted pro to programmatic. And now programmatic is great if you want to target every single human on planet Earth, but it isn't the best for the types of stories that need to be told. Now, why sure. do I care about that? Sight, sound, and motion equal emotion. You know that. 75% mm -hmm. of purchase decisions are made emotionally. You sell to the heart, you justify it to the head. If you're going to hit somebody with a 328, no, sorry, 350 by a 350 by 250 ad or a 728 by 90, Ooh, those formats. Numbers. <laughs> yeah, with those, those formats that are cut across every single page across the internet, they're not the best place to be able to tell stories. So telling stories, yes, but the telling piece, mm, that's the problem with it. So really simply, if you could tell good stories, you know, build good content, put them in smart places is probably a better way to paraphrase storytelling, which is even harder to do. So the story is the baseline. The most important story or sequence to a story on planet Earth is once upon a time. Mm, yeah. How lovely. <laughs> it's pretty hard to think about once upon a time when you try to jam ads down everyone's throats across the internet universe. And that's where I get hung up on this. So the rest of that presentation, I hope said, forget about the telling, focus on the story. It did. And, it and when did. you focus on, thank God I'm consistent. <laughs> but when you focus on the story, then you need to worry about the medium and is the medium the message? And that's really critical when we think about how to articulate stories. And so I'm still a big fan of delicious, artful stories that could be super short or super long or in, involved in motion or not. It's really just about how you're going to provoke an emotion. 
So what are the, who are, who are some of the brands that are doing this right? Because I agree with you. I think that the medium is really important. That's another thing that we often talk about. Like you can be on every social platform, but if your clients aren't there, then why are you there? And what is your message that you're, you're sharing on these different social platforms? Well, I don't think everybody should be on every social platform, by the way. Well, no, I just, I mean, like if it's appropriate for your oh, um, target audience, then yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank God we agree to that, Regina, because here's the deal. I mean, at the end of the day, first things first, I think every brand on planet Earth should do a proper audit because we have really enjoyed shiny object syndrome. But the problem with that is, you know, if you are an old established brand and you act like a 15 year old in an environment that is appropriated for 15 year olds, then you're probably not going to be the hottest brand on planet Earth there because you're actually trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. But, you know, one of the areas that I find fascinating, particularly around paid content as opposed to paid ads, is the branded content world. And the branded content world's been coming, as you know, for the longest time. And the reason why it's coming and why it's here and why it's arrived from a place to tell good stories is simply because it typically has an audience there that you can amass. Organic content, sure, amazing. But not everybody has the ability to do that. But, you know, if you look at the content marketing marketplace, it's like a $280 billion marketplace. It's absolutely enormous. But, you know, to answer your question directly, who's doing it really well? Lego doing a phenomenal oh. job for two reasons. One, if somebody said to me, what's the best piece of branded content you've ever seen, Shingy? It's clearly a Lego movie. You know, I've just paid 20 bucks or something back in the day when I went to a cinema. <laughs> <laughs> now you can do that right from your home. Feels like. I don't know what that feels like <laughs> anymore. But I just, spent, I just spent that money for two and a half hours of them jamming down Lego bricks to me. That's absolutely phenomenal from a brand placement. Yeah, they also are super smart culturally because they're doing things like, you know, they did a, collaboration with Levi's. Yep. So I think about Levi's as a nostalgic brand from whenever. Let's, talk, let's call 70s probably is when they were really, really super hot. But because nostalgia is super hot right now, they do this 1980s vibe with these jackets and they've got these leather Lego patches on it. So you actually build Lego on the, the, the wares that you have. Mm-hmm. So as much as they do these incredible things that feel really kind of long and storyline, they do these other things of collaboration, which I thought was really quite amazing with the brand that sort of feels, fits like its lineage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think Lego is a really impressive brand. I also think there's just other brands that just understand their designer log. Now, what do I mean by that? Yeah, to turn my coin up is a shingism. So designer log is, can you tell stories through visuals that create a dialogue for your brand? And I particularly thought about this before Instagram became a thing. Okay. So we all know the darlings of the DTC world currently have built all their social currency across the way that they have these incredible conversational images. That becomes even more important today than ever before because there may not be ads. They may Their social currency may be their form of ads, and that's what they think about their customer acquisition costs, you know. It's all about making sure their, their, their DTC brand is very authentic. So I really like some of the sort of DTC darlings. The challenge with that is are they able to take that designer log and then move that into the culture of the other parts of places they need to market outside of social. And I don't know whether that's really translated really well. So, yeah, I mean, while the brands do I think are amazing, uh, I think that anything that clearly Nike do is great because they create spikes. And what I like about spikes is that they, they, they tend to create definitions of an announcement, meaning they pick a place that they want to be in and they stand true to that. But then you can't typically do, you know, Colin's a great example of that. You know, they supported him when he took the kneel. And, and what I thought was amazing about that, and I'm not a sports fan. Right. So I'm already out of my depths talking about it, but I was aware of it because they were reflecting cultural changes in marketing. However, recently they also backlashed against um, little, 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 what is his name? Anyway, he did the. Oh, little Nas. Thank you. Did the fun, fancy song, fabulous, yeah. blah, blah, blah. He's like mm-hmm. Madonna of today's age, really. Oh, I showed my daughter that video. She was like, look at how revolutionary this is. I'm like, Madonna did break. this 20, yeah, it's years totally, ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Madonna was totally there. I'm sure she was having a good ta-ha-ha. I'm surprised you didn't pop up in it, by the way. Would have been really, right. I did that, dude. But, you know, it's really, and, you know, she did the full page books and stuff. Yes, and, I mean, yes, you know, Madonna yes, is dope. I love it. I love it. Amazing. And, you know, he came out with the sneakers from Nike and they said, hey, we don't, we haven't endorsed this or believe it. And he's like, well, screw you. And I love that because they, you know, they, they typically try and appropriate to the culture they care about. Uh, but that don't, doesn't mean they always get it right because I think they were really wrong in coming out with that. They should have quickly said, yeah, we're going to do a collab on this. Um, yeah, you know, I think 
sometimes brands will, will definitely um, do that. We saw that with um, Sherwin Williams too. Do, do you remember that? The, uh, the employee who was mixing all the really cool paint colors and oh, then yeah. got fired because they said you did it while you were working. And there was an opportunity there to really capitalize on, on I mean, he had, he had a larger following in the company themselves. So it's like- <laughs> Doesn't that tell you something? Right, exactly. That also, that also tells you something. You know, Ikea back in the day shut down a site which was called Ikea Hacks. So they, you know, I have this term, which is, you know, you need to, if, if you use the word innovation, we need to be an innovative company. It means you're being out innovated. And Ikea at the time shut down, you know, Ikea hacks, but fast forward to five, six, seven, eight years later, the Milan Design Show 2019, they had an Ikea hack section where you take the standard homogenized Ikea wares and they, they were actually doing these collabs as well as hacks. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, if they embrace that, it could have been a way more different definition. Oh, However, yeah. somebody like Ikea have done two things that I think are remarkable. One, they've understood that sustainability is incredibly powerful and will be moving forward. So they're forward in their thinking that makes it everyday objects um, collectible. Let me explain what I'm saying. I think they have this term, which is air is our enemy, meaning mm -hmm. everything comes flat back because Anything that has air in it means it's going to be heavier on shipping. It's bigger on the carbon footprint. Carbon footprint is going to be much more in our vernacular moving forward. Oh, yeah, I remember back true. being in London about, you know, 10, 12 years ago, they were trying to do carbon offset for offices way back in the day, way ahead of it. But individual carbon footprint is going to become more important. People are going to become aware of that. Whether it's a gimmick like a credit card that allows you to show what your carbon footprint cost is with things that you purchase, or it's sim something simple like IKEA saying air is our enemy, they're aware of it. But they've also do things where they become really interesting and cool because they're part of the culture. And what I mean by cool, I don't mean that in a, I don't mean that in a hot or not. I mean that in that they have always understood where trends are going, and they themselves can turn that into a trend. So for the bag that they have, which I don't remember the name of it, but that blue bag that they have, mm -hmm. there was Balenciaga came out with a bag that was exactly modeled off that. And okay. it's like a $4,000 bag. Right. And it was an, and Ikea came out with an ad and said $4,500 or 99 cents. <laughs> and by the way, it listed the benefits, meaning, it, you know, it crinkles so you can, you can, you can, you can't creep up on somebody. It means people are going to know you're coming. There right. are all these, but you can fold it up into a tiny thing and slip it into your pocket. There are, they took all the benefits of a bag that was 99 cents versus the $4,000 bag and made it uber cool. They also did something during the, during the pandemic where they took one of the tags, one of the most popular products and made a t-shirt jacket out of it. And it sold out. So it's this swing tag information that's utilitarian but became really interesting so and it was featured in all the hype beast brands which i thought was amazing they also did one other thing during the pandemic where they created as you know these virtual avatars have become really quite mm -hmm. prolific across social particularly and they took one of them and put them in the front window of one of the stores in tokyo of their store and had this avatar interact with all these products which really bridged the physical and digital in a way that i felt like was really unique and extended their brand to say, we are future-proofing it by bringing this culture. Mm -hmm. But guess what? You can participate in real life, which is what you want to get to. So it's really good forward thinking. So there are two fairly dormant brands. Yeah. Not dormant. I mean, but God, Lego is one of the most charismatic brands on planet Earth. But if you look <laughs> at Lego and Ikea, I think they run in parallel. And they also do interesting collabs together. And then obviously people like Nike are the obvious ones. And then the darlings of the DTC, I think, are really quite good. Okay. So we have a couple of questions here. Um, oh, crap, Rebecca, already? Yeah. Uh, she says, is there a basis for nostalgia and futurism when the good old days may be problematic? Wow. Rebecca, is she a student or? I don't know. Um, I would say probably since probably the majority of people joining us are students. Rebecca, can you reply and just tell me whether you're a student or not? And I'm going to say that I did an interview series with nine CMOs recently. And the number one thing that was the pull thread I could find out about these guys was nostalgia, 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 nostalgia was everything. Really? Why? Because we want to be comforted, one, and we want to feel safe and secure. And we are back as humans to these things that made us feel like that. She's an alum. Okay. So if you're able, if you represent a brand, if you're able to take that essence of nostalgia, you have a window where you can capitalize upon that because everybody's still in a state of constant fuzziness. It doesn't matter whether there are problematic issues with nostalgia, you tend to forget about those. All you 
reflect them back as folklore that makes it funny or sad. You take what you want out of it. And by the way, that's the most important thing. It's either going to be funny or it's going to be sad. It shouldn't be meh. Because if it's that, then it wasn't really that interesting. But nostalgic is going to be, could you relate to it from a music perspective? Could you relate to it from a fashion perspective? Does it psychologically make somebody feel more confident? And is that part of the psychology around it? Maybe. When I spoke to the CMO of Smuckers, they weren't inventing new products during COVID, not because they couldn't, because it was a super quiet time. They could have come up with things that are really interesting. They just couldn't get enough supply for peanut butter and jam. You know, PBJs, people were just jamming on that thing. So there's no, no time to come out with a new thing, whatever they sell. But right. what's amazing from my perspective is that, yes, it absolutely is important. But as I said, the things that are problematic, they're not at the forefront of that. And if they are, it's either a funny story or a sad story. And both of those things could be actually used to, to help sort of affect the emotions of people. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. If that's All helpful. Right. It was, that was great. Um, so I've heard you talk a little bit about the fourth industrial Revo revolution. Can mm. you talk to us about what it is and why it's important for us as communicators and, and communications professionals? Yeah, the fourth industrial revolution is being powered by intelligence. And the intelligence that I'm talking about is artificial, mainly, mm -hmm. or otherwise. But every single device, whether you're wearing a device, like a wearable today, of which there are almost 600 of them in the number one category is fitness, you know, if you think about that, it is actually, it's building intelligence on your profile. Sure. All of the things that are happening with your phone, whether it's geolocation, whether it's the motion, the number of times you touch it, the apps you open and close, the things you're authentically logged into, the things you pause as you search, all the stuff that you don't clear out on your phone, all of that stuff is articulating intelligence. And this has been coming for 20 years. This is not new. This is not a new revolution. This is slow moving revolution. It suddenly feels like it's arrived, but it took forever to get here. Well, it did, and it has done. I mean, back in the day, if you guys want to look at look some shits and gills, go and look up Last FM. Last oh. FM was an incredible algorithm that would resurface music to you based on the genres and taste that you've actually circulated. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. That's every single music platform on planet Earth today doing a good job of that, or in my case, a crappy job of it, because I'm all over the place in terms of genres. So intelligence is coming. But what is it architected upon? It's architected upon data gathering. So if you're able to gather data on somebody in a way that is interesting, meaning the information you get from somebody is more interesting than the way you, the way you're gathering the data and the way you present it back is more interesting than they expected. They're likely to give you more data. And if you don't do that, they'll just give you the um, sort of the amount of data that you're expecting. And then you're going to have to do the hard work. And that hard work is thinking about personas and having to sort of understand what the group means and what that offshoot is. But if you've got the absolute data, and particularly if it's first party data, you're going to have to be able to use that intelligently. Uh, now, the challenge with that is we move to a cookie-less world. It's going to be really hard to understand how you're doing profiling of people if the cookies are removed. So there's only two things left. When you've done that audit trail, you've got these third-party applications of which you don't own, but you rent the audiences from. That's every social platform on planet right. Earth because you don't own them. Or the flip side of that is get good at collecting first-party data because that's what's going to have to happen. You can't assume the data anymore, and you can't actually just rely on the rest of the web to rent that data because cookie-less is going away. I read a report recently that said 8 out of 10 marketers believe that cookie-less world won't affect their marketing. Are you kidding me? Really? That's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, IAB published something like that. I think it was in Europe. I mean, it makes no sense to me at all. So you have to collect that data. So that's really what's going to be the thing that's behind moving intelligence forward. Also, intelligence are articulated in every device that's connected today. Anything that's got a Wi-Fi enablement sure. or low-powered Bluetooth enablement is collecting data. So all of those things are actually going to make these seamless decisions for you that feel like you've done them or just suddenly feel more you know, more convenient, but they're presented up as intelligent. So as marketers, you just have to be aware that they're parts of the tool set. They're just as important as fonts, colors, motions, etc. And yeah. so you have to become really good as a data nerd, as well as understanding to become a marketing nerd. Both of those things are important. Yeah, I think that I love that you said at the very beginning, um, 
that this revolution is sort of already here because we talk a lot about that in, in classes. Um, you know, when I talk about AI to my students, I said, every time we talk about AI, it's as though it's this thing that's coming. It's here. We are mm -hmm. like in the third iteration of AI at this point. And so it's only going to advance quicker. So I think that that's important as, as communications professionals to really understand and then capitalize on, on that data, which you know, yeah, go ahead. Well, also the most important thing about that statement is why is it getting quicker? It's getting quicker because we're consuming more information faster. Right. And so the accumulation of this information is getting absolutely out of control. Layer on top of that autonomy. So we've been in the world of autonomy for the longest time. The planes that you fly, well, when we used to fly planes, <laughs> or, the, or the public transport that's all sort of mechanized around places. A lot of that is done using autonomy. But if you look at personal cars that are connected, this sort of universal Wi-Fi, which today might be 5G moving forward, when we think about that, the amount of data that is collected just to be able to tell you there's an accident ahead and it's going to tell you that it's much closer than anything Waze could tell you today oh, or yeah. any of those mapping systems, that is an enormous amount of data that's being collected. So it's, it's the volume of data that has to be sliced and diced and understood that is going to make intelligence engines far more interesting. Okay, so we have a question that I think sort of feeds off of what we've been talking about here. This is from Donna and she is an alum. Um, she says, we live in a world of Twitter headlines and Instapics at a time when data is taking over the world. There's so much of it. Can you give us a thought on how we tell stories in such a fast paced world where we can't catch up, where we can't catch up trying to keep up with artificial intelligence, data analytics and people not really present? Mm. Oh, well, there's about 10 statements in there and <laughs> perhaps a question. Um, what was her name? Donna. Donna? Hey, Donna. I did remember that. See how I'm, I'm as, as, fu as fuzzy as most? I have this phrase, which is just a constant state of fuzzy, and I believe that the pandemic has brought it to the forefront. But if you're even thinking about the curiosity of the creator generation, and what I mean about that is not the person who's just sitting at a job doing their job, but somebody who actually really feels like they want to be an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, um, which is every person I speak to who are around 25 and under. Right. Because by the time you're 30, by the way, I'm told you're going to have seven or eight jobs anyway. So part of that is if the world moves, moves, if the world moves forward towards the gig economy, more and more people are going to be polymathed, which already means they're going to express the things that they're interested in in ways that they hope can monetize it. So when you think about, let's just take Twitter and you take uh, Instagram as two of them. A lot of these creators are trying to create content that not just communicates loves, desires, et cetera, but also trying to monetize upon that. So our jobs as humans are actually heightened to understand whether or not that is something that's promotion or is something that's proof that they're actually in love with it. I can't say that's necessarily the case for Twitter. I haven't been on Twitter for probably two years, maybe longer. I mean, I occasionally lurk on there maybe once every I six think, months or so i think it's been a i think it's been 2017 because when we were in a doing, while yeah oh longer than that yeah i kind of retired from it you know there's a time when the internet was hating on me and i'm like screw you i can make a decision not to participate and i still have people ping me and say hey man would you come back and i'm kind of like really it's twitter not really 140 <laughs> characters isn't that interesting to flame somebody so i can do it in two words but here's what's interesting in my mind. If I look at something like Instagram, which is more interesting because it's the visual-based culture based on our cortex, the visual cortex, where I find it's going to be most interesting for you to think about is whether you can move that further out and go back here into the ears. Because the audio piece of it today, if nothing more than the last 12 months has proven, is that this is a channel that has not really been expressed. It has in things like podcasts, yes, but I think uh, the average person in the US listens to four hours of audio a day. That's a lot of time to have somebody in your ear to think about this stuff. It doesn't have to be about the visual-based culture of which you can say yes and no to. Like, yeah, that feels a bit off to me. But when it comes into your ear, it becomes interesting. So if I look at places like Clubhouse, which is kind of live podcasting, a bit like what we're doing today without the visuals, I think that's really interesting because you'll have this intimacy in an audio experience and probably vulnerability because you're not always on camera. So I think it's going to express a different type of element. So I don't know whether it's going to be more of more senses to have to worry about or less, mm -hmm. more intimate, which means you can go wider. So I'm looking for channels where there's, there's intimacy, intimacy in depth where you want to spend time there. Uh, I'm doing a talk, I think, in May or something for one of the largest tech channels within, within Clubhouse. 
And the guy who runs that, he spends on average 21 hours a day on Clubhouse. Wow. So you can imagine how fuzzy that kid is. But what's interesting is that some of the things that we were fuzzy about have been replaced. Now, every tech universe on planet Earth is trying to get people off their devices. Why? Because they probably feel guilty. But just alone in, in, in Apple Store, there's 150 apps telling you you're spending too much time on your device. Okay. Now, if I ask audiences live physically who's done a digital detox, more hands go up than ever before. And a lot of them say that in the first day or two, they feel fuzzy or the first afternoon, they'll feel super weird that they have, don't have it with them. But if you get enough time away from your device, you feel actually less distracted. You feel more connected and you actually feel more productive. And so if we are able to counterbalance the health relationship of technology connection and what part of that we use for active participation, what part we use for passive participation, which really isn't participation at that point, or what part of that we use for contribution, then if we were to do that audit, I think we'd spend a lot less time in these devices scriping our lives, lives away. Because the rule of 1% of people originate a story 9% comment and 90% are passive, that definitely still plays today, particularly in you know, places like TikTok and Instagram. And it, it is a, a great place to feel terrible in many respects. But if you do a proper audit against that, and I'm hoping people will, there will be less dependency on pass passivity of, of technology, particularly if you're going to be spending most of your time in Zoom today. Now, I don't know what the question was, Regina, if I've answered it at all, but I, I've certainly hit a lot of statements and I hope that's part of it. Absolutely. But Donna, I'm happy to go deeper on that if you like, if, if <laughs> meandered. Uh, so, well, we can always come back. And While she she's thinking about that. Little, right, exactly. <laughs> Rebecca too, I guess. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, so talk to us a little bit about how brands can harness digital, social, how can they harness some of these technologies? Because to your point right there, we are really fragmented. Um, you know, you and I in the past have talked about the addiction of, of devices and right. how we sort of want to try to move past that. Um, and I think that, that a lot of people are trying to find a little bit more peace in their life and that they're not always connected to their phone and they're not always connected to, to different, to different um, technologies, iPads, things like that. So if you're a brand and you're trying to truly connect, because I think you know, if we go back to what social media was supposed to be, it's this connection of of me on one side of a computer as a human and you on another side, right? As a human right. and we're connecting. Yeah, I think there are a couple of things in that statement. There's the idealistic part of what I think about, mm -hmm. which is I wish, I just wish it was, you know, brands could be more authentic, which is probably the most cliched statement I've ever heard. <laughs> but I believe in it for two reasons. Yeah. One is if you're a brand that doesn't have to do polish, and the behind the scenes is more important than the front of the scenes. And it could have to do with the supply chain management. It could do with the audit trail of where you're headed as a product development. All these things that sort of actually hit on things that people care about, particularly the audience that care about it. And if we think about young audiences today, sustainability is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the environment's a huge part of that. Um, trade ethics is a huge part of that. Small carbon footprint is a huge part of that. But if you're an advertiser just going out there and advertising something that is completely countercultural to where the culture is headed, you deserve to be blinded. And what I mean by that is that you, had a, you better set up straight and organize your product set to actually reflect the values of people that particularly young audience care about. And that's the audience you're going for is a bullseye. Or you can sit there and still be nostalgic and old fashioned and all those things if that's what your audience is looking for. Because some audiences grew up with advertising and absolutely see that as the tax they pay. And others are saying advertising sucks. But if I understand the culture of the internet, brands are part of that. I consume brands every day. So therefore, I'm able to cherry pick the ones that I care about. And they don't all have to be young, hip and cool. They could actually be brands that sort of feel like they just value. I also think brands that do adjust culturally across not just social, but their product set. And therefore, they can reflect that across their social because it's more in line with what they want. And it moves it away from advertising awareness into advocacy, word of mouth, peer-to-peer, -peer, interconnected mm -hmm. humans. Yay. Um, they get it right. So a good example of that is Burger King. Okay. Mm -hmm. What about yeah. them? In the fast food experience, everything that they've done in the last 12 months is absolutely genius. And prior to that, also. Well, what are some of those? Well, they moved. They've known the culture's moved away from understanding that 
And all of the greenhouse gases that have affected across the world, the biggest contributor to that is bloody food of our consumption, meat. So if they can remove or add to their menu one item that is meatless and they can consider that as something that's true to them, that wasn't going to be their product team that told them that. It was marketing who told them that. Right. Genius. Second thing is, okay, what about non-GMO product? So all of their products now are non-GMO. Brilliant. Is it going to help them sell more burgers? Probably not for the vast majority of them. For those who are conscious, will. And, th- and this is a long road. This is not a quick sprint. It's a marathon. And they've been in this business for years and years. So, you know, if you're a dirty burger chain that just wants to do dirty burgers, awesome, stick to it. But if you have an, uh, as an ounce of ethos that changes, then you can reflect that. And I think what they did was amazing. But they also did some things that aligned with humans. You know, in Paris, they said, hey, here are all the ingredients. Because you can't get to our restaurants, they're closed. Here are all the ingredients to make your own little whopper. In the Middle East, when people were being fired, they said, hey, we know we're going through hard times. Pay us what you can. Get us back later. Now, they did a full page ad where they say, go and buy products from our competitors including mcdonald's why because humans are working there and we really need you to support them it's all good for all of us i think that's genius right and so you know there are there are times when you think about that their business model has transformed so therefore their marketing is a reflection of that transformation if you're in the world of just saying all i'm doing is pushing sugar fat and whatever to people and it's horrendous for them well, it's probably not going to work out so great for you if you're trying to sugarcoat the advertising on top of that, in my humble opinion. So it's a really good self-reflection time, one for us, all of us generally, and also what you're going to do moving forward. So it's, it's finding those little nuggets to understand there's, this, there's beautiful authenticity in what I'm saying because it's reflected upon the product. It makes the brand marketed job so much easier, but not every brand can be like that, I understand, but it, boy, it's good when they do. Um, so you're kind of touching on something that Bonnie has asked. So she said, do you think ethics might have a resurgence in the post-pandemic world? So, I mean, some of these examples that you've already provided are a little bit of, of, of ethics. It's, it's, and it's goodwill and it's authenticity, like you're talking about. Right. Um, so, you know, do you think that there might be something that changes there? Yeah, the fact you're asking that question means it's happening already. The answer is absolutely. But ethics also has to be reflected upon ethos. So if the ethos of the organization and or the brand, it starts inside the organization, by the way. So if the organization themselves want to actually believe in something, left or right, red or blue, whatever the thing is that they believe in, if they don't start internally with those ethics, they can't amplify that externally, particularly if we're thinking about human truth here. In fact, I just, I was reading over the weekend, camp, camp, camp base. Basecamp, oh, base, base sorry, camp. the project, the, yes. yeah, the project management software of mm-hmm. bloody 20 years ago, uh, you know, it's one of the tools that I've used for a while, evidently not recently, given I can remember their name, but they basically <laughs> said, hey, people internally can't talk about politics and all these people are leaving. I'm like, hmm, probably a little off color, brother, because at the end of the day, your organization has to stand behind something. And if you're going to sit there and say, oh, we're agnostic, we're great, we're great for everybody, it means you stand for nothing. And so I would say you have to be careful and and look at the human truth of it. But ethics, absolutely. For all the right reasons, sustainability, the environment, what we're doing to Mother Earth, what we're doing to the seas and oceans that are ending up in our food chain. If you've got a plan to change that as a business, you need to get ahead of that and understand how you're going to change it and what the path to actually doing that. Why? Because people care. Why do they care? We've, We've created an environment where people aren't, they're not able to pay the taxes that have been left behind. So they may, the younger generation today are going to have the most affluent generation of wanting to buy luxury goods, but they've got in their background all of these tax. And when I say talk about taxes, I'm talking about what we've done to the environment, how we're actually not recycling plastics properly, all of these things that are based on ethics coming at us. So it's, it's going to be at the forefront of every brand on planet Earth, all of these things that before you could out-advertise. So, you know, we used to advertise stuff that, and hope people would want them. Now you have to actually build stuff that people want. And all you're doing is telling them with good stories. And that's the thing that's really different. It's a different paradigm. And ethics is at the base of it. Yes, underscore, underscore, underscore. <laughs> I think that, that I, I, would, I would completely agree with you. And I also think that there's a piece of the AI 
you know, um, the ethics of AI and the ethics of, of, of building, you know, platforms that, you know, we're using on a regular basis. So I think ethics sort of spans quite a, diff a, a few different areas. Let me give you, and let me give you one example where I think AI and ethics come into play really quickly. There's a company called Drift AI, okay. who I really respect because what they've done is they've created, and it's a very simple custom assistant, but it's a little robot. And you know, mm -hmm. it's a robot. And you know that what you're going to type in, it's going to give you a nice quick answer. And it's going to continue asking these questions back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until it says, you know what, too hard. Let me hand it off to a human. Okay. Awesome. How many times have you gone to a site that's customer service orientated and you're thinking to yourself, I'm being gamed here and I don't know that. <laughs> I actually don't know if I'm talking to Regina or whether I'm talking to a bot, but you kind of get to it at a point where you're like, I kind of really know what I'm dealing with here, man. It's terrible. You know, because how many times you, you, you press one for a representative or whatever oh, you know? So immediately, if you think, zero. So if you think about that, somebody like Drift comes out and says, hey, why don't I make a system that says super quick, super fast, I'm going to be able to give you exactly what you need. And when you don't, I'm going to hand you off. But I can probably support 90% of the inquiries. Great. Brilliant. That's a great use of intelligence. Also a great use of understanding of what they're building is a great you know, artificial intelligence that the organization that represents that tool can then use for better customer service and come into a different way. I don't know. Okay. I like it. So <laughs> awesome. I do. I think it's good. I, I mean, I, all right. So here's, here's, well, when you were talking, something else popped into my head. Okay. Um, have you heard of Copysmith AI? What is it? Copysmith AI. Copysmith. Oh uh, yeah, is this a this a paragraph free writer? One of those? Yes, a bunch yes, of them. Yeah. exactly. So yeah. it writes your content for you yeah. and uh, rewrites talk, it. Right? Doesn't write no, the content. No, mm -mm, no, it huh. writes it for you. You can give them keywords or a small little prompt, and oh it, my. yeah, and <laughs> I know, right? It's kind mm. of a little bit mind blowing. I I used this in my class the other day to show my students. We talked about ethics. Is it ethical to do this? And then we discussed well, you know idea generation. So it was a big, long conversation, but um, at the end of the day, it can create entire blog posts for you. It can create um, captions for Instagram or tweets for you. So everything that we've been talking about here today, I sort of feel like there is this, this idea of, of authenticity and being true with your customers. The, to me, that sort of throws a whole wrench into it, right? We are using advanced technologies. It's based on GPT-3. So I don't know. I mean, what do you think about programs like that that are just there for practitioners to, here, I need a blog post and I can I mean, have I, one. I have <laughs> two seconds. I have two points about that, Regina. I'm sorry okay. to cut you off. Was there no, something? No, go ahead. There are, there are two things. I'm, I'm having a bit of a smirk about it because look, if you can use these enablements to make sure that you can be more efficient and be better with your output and spend more time in front of other humans, God bless. However, the flip side of that is, yeah, keep using those tools. Why? Because we're going to end up with a bunch of really crappy content out there. I know. And what will happen, frankly, it happened to me. Look, those of you who are young, all of you that are young, God damn it, here's what happened to me. <laughs> I was the last school of traditional advertising, graphic design. I knew how to, I still know how to kern fonts. You guys want to do a font debate? Let's do it. I can show you what a Bembo looks like versus a Galliard versus a Garamond versus a blah, blah. You know, we could go right down the list. I can hand cone fonts. It's how I, how I learned them. Pantone squeaky markets, which you've never seen. Letrosets you've never played with. Bromides you've never actually done typeset markup on. You know, we used to bloody have to do post photography, putting extra pepperoni on a Pizza Hut pizza. The stuff is for real. And it took days and weeks and had whole industries employed. I was the last school of traditional advertising. The next school, graphic design, computers. People came to me and said, your industry is dead, dead, dead. Design is dead. And guess what? It died. And what happened, though, and the reason it died, there were 250 fonts, there were 16.7 million colors, a bunch of printers out there. Everybody had the software. Everyone was a designer. And God bless them, because nobody had taste. And if you're a craftsperson who's able to understand the difference between that, you end up seeing this homogenized experience. You've got this little humpy bit in the middle. The bit in the middle is tonnage. Tonnage is fine, man, until it isn't. And then you realize you need craft because there's excellent craft and there's crappy craft and there's an automated bit in the middle. The automated bit in the middle is where we are today. So you're going to be able to see through that because you, you just know. Go and look up, if you haven't done it already, look at TV ads that are done by AI only. They mm. lack spirit. They lack emotion. 
Now text, you could probably get some of that in there if you get the right adjectives and it's all gonna be crafted correctly, but it may not have the emotion. So AI is brilliant at telling you what to do, not how to do it. That's where the creative and that's where the human is very, very different. So yeah, it's gonna absolutely catapult a bunch of things, but it's just gonna create this big hump of crappy content that ultimately you're gonna say, oh, they, that's really crappy. We need really good stuff to stand out now. And that's gonna to have to be done differently, I think. Yeah, I, I would have to agree with you. I mean, you should play with it. You can get like a, a few days oh, free. I, and just, oh, wait. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's really fun. Uh, and, and to your point about like different voices, like you could be professional, funny, serious. You could choose all these different types, wow. which you know, again, at the end of the day, I said to my students, this is a tool right? Mm. You are the one that is, that needs to write the content. You are the one that needs to develop that story. And what is it that you want your, you know, uh, customers or audience to connect with, but this is just, and, and I, I don't think they're going to be the only ones. And, and I don't believe that they are actually, I think they're just one of the loudest voices right now in the marketplace that's offering this tool up. Yeah. And the thing that I would love to see is that whether I can replace words for emojis and see what they write around that. Oh, I don't know that it can. You see what do I'm saying? That. So this, I'm kind of headed to a totally different place now. And so, look, I, I I can't wait to see how these systems play. And I've seen a lot of these automation tools across any, any industry that can be automated. There are automation tools. Where I think the AI is working incredibly well are, are tools such as if anybody's a filmmaker, it's incredibly difficult through the edits to do sound sequences. Mm. And you either can't license top 10 music because you don't have the budget and or you pick this really, really crappy music that's across the internet, but you can't create the emotion. It doesn't match it. But there's a company called uh, Dino Music, I think, something like that, that okay. I'll send it to you. You can send it to yeah. the alums. Please. And it, you can just basically take a whatever two-minute video, pick the genre of sound that you want, drop it into it, and it's going to actually match edit. And it's pretty amazing. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, anyway. I think... I don't know. Those are, I, I love learning about new technology and tools like that, because I do think at the end of the day, it, it helps us. If you use those tools correctly, it can help us hone yeah. our craft and become better professionals. Right. Mm. So, all right. So question, what is your favorite social media platform right now? Why, what do you think we should be looking at? I'm um, still Insta. And the reason okay. for that is I, I made a decision a few years ago, just to pull back from using it as a I, I, because I teach this to brands, why would I not do it to myself, which is don't just populate one piece of content everywhere. How rubbish is that? Mm -hmm. So the truth is, you know, I, I pulled back one day and thought Instagram for me should just be a photographic experience. And so I shoot things in black and white on my phone to challenge the way I shoot. So I don't do anything in post. I might do a little contrast, but that's it. So I don't take an image and then blah, 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 go through all the crappy things. Mm -hmm. I just shoot it in black and white on my old crappy iPhone. That's, I tested myself to do that. So, so that's what my Insta is, super, super simple, black and white. I shoot, it, I shoot it on my phone in black and white. So I use it as a posting space because I wanted to see what it really is. It's a visual communication tool, mm -hmm. regardless of how many people in there use it for everything else. That's how I use it. And the other one I think is, you know, anything that's got to do with live podcasting I'm across. So sure. whether that's, you know, probably the most I spend time in would, would be Clubhouse because I do a session there with Forbes. But I also, you know, I spend time in the other ones as well, but I just find the, the, anything in the audio space is interesting to me. What do you love uh, about Clubhouse? I love the fact that it feels like South by Southwest 10 years ago before your kids were born and <laughs> you could go up and down the aisles before you had to, you know, stand out front of somewhere for a couple of hours and go into a session. You used to be able to walk up and down the aisles and just duck into somebody talking about something. And if you thought that guy wasn't very good or that girl wasn't very good, you could leave, just yeah. sneak out quietly and duck into another one. That's what I like about it. Okay. Is that it plays to my ADD where I can go in and go, yeah, this kind of works or this doesn't work or this sucks or somebody finds me there and like, can you come up and speak? I'm like, not really. I'm out of here. And it's <laughs> and for me, that's really, I find that to be really spontaneous and I find it to be quite contagious. But I find also that, you know, it can suck you down a vortex of lots and lots and lots of time waste, which I tend not to do. Well, that's kind of, I mean, that's similar to TikTok as well, right? A lot of people yeah. say that you get on and you're just like four hours later, you're like, oh, I probably should do something else, right? Yeah. And TikTok is good. It's just very homogenized. Right. Unless you're going searching for something really interesting, like, you know, look up beekeepers or something, you know, the content there is really quite amazing or look up, you know, I, I did an interview with Jason Derulo, who's the number one entertainment celebrity in TikTok. Okay. And he's definitely produced content in a way, in a particular way. And there are a lot of tools out there that allow you to create content in a particular way 
So there are certain scene grabs that you like. Somebody's probably created a shortcut language for that. And that's great because then, but that's also what creates this homogenized content, right? It's not yeah. just all about boobs and babes in that thing, which apparently there's a lot of all, all through dancing. But I try and if I spend any time in it, it's really just to see if there's any content that's really interesting, that's different using that platform. And it feels a bit viney for me. So it's a bit like mm. you know, what Vine was before they took it out back and, yeah. you know, rummaged around with it. Well, it was uh, also musically I was, anyway, so. I yeah, mean, and I was, was a bit, like, yeah. I was off on musically because uh, I thought it was really quite amazing because it allowed kids to be able to express themselves yes. until the lurkers came along and started to harass. There's always going to be evil in there. And so, I don't know. I think TikTok is interesting, but not really that interesting. But I really still like Pinterest. Okay. Which is a odd one for two reasons. One, it allows you to, you know, it obviously allows you to create boards of interest so mm -hmm. it, it gives a visual display that's quite lovely and secondly there's no hate in there no it's just, you're right it's, just, it's actually a really kind of and maybe that's why people don't like it i don't know i don't go there for snark if i go to if i want snark man i go straight to reddit reddit's perfect <laughs> for that i love reddit for <laughs> snark so true. and the subreddits but I, I think pinterest is one of the it's one of the unsung heroes for brands and just for people generally particularly if you have an interest in things that it's good at. So for me, for things like architecture and design, it's lovely, lovely, lovely. I sometimes feel like people, when you go to Pinterest, there's a purpose why you're going, you're looking for True. something, right? And so that's a, a little bit tool. different. Yes, exactly. And so it's different mm. than other um, social media uh, apps and platforms and things. That's because it's the third largest search engine too. You know that, right? right. Yes, I know. I know. So that's why it's, you go there because it's interest-based. Yes. And that's what I really think about Pinterest is really good. And they, they actually support brands really well too. So I think their code of ethics across that is pretty, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, not to so say that I use it all the time though. The <laughs> question was, what was my favorite? It's not the ones that I use. The one that I use most is still Instagram just because it's, I'm, I'm individuals, man. I used to take photos back in the day. So I still I know. do. Your, your Instagram definitely has an aesthetic to it. So it's got a vibe. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Completely. <laughs> Thank, All right, we have a I question. Think, I think that's a good thing. It is. It's a really good thing. Okay. Absolutely. Um, a question from Nick. He says, "At what point does the cycle complete and content become useless? I think we might be closer than we think. So once the value of content disappears, what happens next? Mm. What is our next marketing currency? Does it explode and then we start over again to develop new de definitions of quote unquote content?" Yeah, great question, Nick. Uh, you know, my background's media and marketing for the last decade, so you, you're, tr you're absolutely right. The cost of producing content outweighs the ability to have it monetized, period, full stop. So there's only two ways that that plays out. Either you try and reinvent it and sell it, <laughs> or you get somebody with deep pockets who wants it because it has a nostalgia to them and or an interest to them. So all these beautiful mastheads that are going to survive and do well and thrive have all either created really interesting niches within those categories a la the new york times or they have somebody come through and fund it incredibly well because that person believes in it and can use it as an outlet which is good or bad i don't know a la washington post but you know you've got these different ways of thinking about how you're going to change that the core of that content which is the most expensive way of building it which is where the paradigm we're all trying to figure out next is clearly just all video 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 because it does a couple of things one you can grab beautiful stills off video so you can post those everywhere else with your visual based culture for your visual cortex and then of course you can pull sound from it hence the reason this thing right now could be a podcast as well as a video cast yeah. awesome, awesome. and then the third thing you could do is actually have somebody transcribe it so if you're actually going to produce video it's great to have subtitles on it too but you can have an ai machine subscribe that for you sub subscribed it but it's, I think it's interesting just to say that it, it is very expensive to build, but it's also the thing that you can hold most people's attention for. As I said in the earlier statement, the best piece of branded content for me is Lego movie. And yeah, if you do that, it's awesome. Yeah. Okay, Video. good. Uh, quick reminder, we have less than 15 minutes. So if you have any oh, questions, sorry. please I've make sure really that you're- haven't I? Uh, No, no, no. I was just telling people if they have questions to please make sure they use the Q&A so that we can get to them if they have questions. I thought you were saying, thank God we've only got 15 minutes left. No, so. are you kidding? I could do like, I don't know, two, three hours with you. We could just chit chat, right? Yeah, yeah you bet. Absolutely. <laughs> I love it. All right. So what trends do you think we should be watching for? Um, mm. 
Yeah. Okay. So in the living room, anything that falls away. So the, the, ti- the time and space in the living room is going, it's going to be less about sitting in front of a 90 inch screen. Those screens are going to fall away and feel environmental. Awesome. 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 Why? Because I think there are typically other people in the room who are going to, you're going to want to face. So I think it's less about television. It's programming because that horse is bolted, dude. So unless you can do beautiful brand integration, which I encourage people to do, it's going to be very, very hard to do things like broadcast advertising. They don't perform the way they used to perform mm. in my mind. And so it's it's more about on demand, obviously. So in the living room, it's there on demand. And the programming is there on demand. So when we move to autonomy, one-on-one, so I don't know about you, public transport's not really on high on my agenda right now. Yes. I'm, I'm a bit of a germaphobe. I'm half Chinese and I've been traveling with a mask for 10 years. So when I see white people with masks before the pandemic started, I thought that was just crazy. And now it's <laughs> not normal, right? But it's interesting. So, I'm, you know, I'm not really into public transport as much as I used to be. But what's interesting about that is it's, it's forcing autonomy much faster in its development. So you'll have these really big, beautiful screens. And so it'll be a screen as a service inside the car. Just be aware of that because we won't be thumbing through life like this. We'll be doing it like this on a bigger screen, but it won't be your living room. It'll be in the automated experiences. And why is that? Because people are moving potentially away from the cities and out to rural environments. So the commutes might be longer, but more productive, which is also something to consider. So that's that's just two things that I'll sort of long draw. Okay. In the short term, for me, it's just, you know, the, the trend of understanding that people's ethics, back to that question, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's become the forefront. Now, particularly in the US, as we've had some really interesting political climate happen, it's been polarized. We all know that. But it also has meant that brands have to have a purpose. They have to believe in something. They have to take a stance. And if you're currently sitting in the middle, you will be forgotten. But you really want to be in a position where you want to be loved or hated. You don't want to be liked. Liked is mm-hmm. rubbish. And so that's something that I believe that people have to. Why? Because if we've got all this noise, back to, I think it was Donna's question, if there's all this fuzzy noise going out there and you're being hit by, you know, 1,500 media messages anyway before lunchtime or whatever, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to have to have cut through. And that cut through doesn't come because you've picked the best shade of purple. Those days are well over. It's come because you've really got a point of view around that and you're able to hold somebody's attention because attention is all we've got left. So if I want to hold your attention, you're going to have to understand what the designer log is. I also say push against homogenization. I think that the internet needs to be punked again. I mean, there is so much of everything out there that it just kind of all looks beautiful and organized and sane. But if we all sat here today and just listened to rock and roll all day, we'd never invent punk. And so there's something about it that just we need to experiment differently. And so these platforms that you're on, if you're looking at them, don't thumb through them, but spend time doing stuff differently in it to stand out, not blend in. That's where I think about, yeah, it's great. There's social currency going around there for things like social currency going on for sort of these these dance moves and that becomes a meme. Mm -hmm. I say just do it differently, you know, do it in reverse, do it in slow-mo or don't do it at all. Do something completely different. And that may seem countercultural, but I think it's what makes people stand out in my mind. Okay. Uh, Catherine has a question. She said, how should a brand rebound from cancel culture? Hmm. Well, there's a reason they got can- cancelled, right? <laughs> That's true. So, you know, that brand, whoever we're talking about, was it Rebecca? Catherine. It? Oh, Catherine, not even bloody close. Hi, Catherine. <laughs> uh, if we're thinking about cancel culture and how to rebound from it, there's a reason it got cancelled. <laughs> so maybe those places aren't the right place for you to be in because, you know, reactivating a, sub- a subscription in a cancel culture is difficult. But there, I think it's got to come back to tr- principles. That con- that conversation is probably being had, which is, well, what do we do to be innovative now? We've been cancelled, or we're part of cancel culture. If you are, if that's the phrasing of the question, where well, that's the wrong question. The question that needs to be asked is, what are we doing to transform? Because there's a reason why we're polarized, or there's a reason why we don't understand what that means, uh, and it's not listening enough. I think the brands that did a, a tremendous job in the last twelve months listened, 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 listened. And when they did come out, they did it in such a lovely way that they heard, probably for the first time in a long time, because they didn't just have to sit there and advertise. So that becomes really interesting. And we're going to move away from things like frequency-based advertising, potentially, into things that's like, this brand gives me such good value, such good advice, such good counsel, such a good product experience that I want to hear from them. I don't want to just click away from them. 
that's where we have to think about it. And that's where I think about cancel culture and advertising world too, maybe. It's a bit of a stretch, isn't it? But you get, you get my drift. So we have a question from uh, one of our, let's see, this is Yolanda. She said, um, what's your advice on so to social media managers and content curators for government accounts? What should, we be, what should we be looking ahead for? Wow, cancel culture, one thing. Two <laughs> will be what other trends that people are finding. You've got to spend some time on Reddit if you don't already. But what's amazing is that what are the trends that people are thinking about within the robustness of, those, of the government subject that, you, that you're curious about? And if it's not the bullseye of your subject, look at the halos. And are, are those things that you could actually have an opinion on? So part of the problem I have with most people that that uh, do have a finite, like they have a they have a, a strong audience, mm -hmm. they don't have a strong point of view, and part of that is because they're not participating. So if somebody is hating on somebody, let's just take that as an example. On a brand, there are so many brands that just won't retaliate or come back and say, "Hey, I, I get it. DM me. Don't DM me. Let's talk about it now in the public domain. Why you don't like it." If you're that confident, then you should be able to talk about it. So part of it, what I'm saying is I'd use that as a, the ability to understand some intelligence and then come back and maybe have a point of view because you have to be an authority, good or bad. You have to have an opinion. You know, if I was thinking about the local council producing a podcast, that is the last thing on planet Earth I'd want to listen to unless it actually was able to be culturally relevant to me based on my values. And until they know what it is, you shouldn't be able to, shouldn't be able to acquire that. So... Th that's for me the other thing if that doesn't work just create memes they seem to work today right but They're relatable. Two, two things. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and but there's two things if you have a point of view and there's a reason for you to have a, a you know a characterization that's memeish for example i mean it could work it could mean that you just feels very human and you're able to self-efface or something that could be another way to think about tone um it's it's all about that it's all about expressing the tonality of a brand and how you're able to articulate it and, Plenty of people have done that in the past, not in the government as, as much, but it's part of the culture that we expect and have a good laugh at. So maybe that would work. There are only two things you need to care about. Can you make somebody laugh or cry? That's it. The rest of it's all information. The rest of it's all utility. But the laugh or cry is really important, particularly if you're trying to gain support because it's the only thing that's going to allow people to basically say this. Am I surprised by this from this account? This is incredible. So therefore, I want to be more surprised. And that's where they're going to have that sustainability, I think. Mm. Okay. Um, Gail asked, what was the new music technology app you mentioned? <sighs> I'm going to tell you, it's done. Um, one, one second, come back, come back to me on that one. Okay. Um, so we have also a question from one of our faculty. And hey. she asked, uh, her name is Beth. She asked, uh, if TV is not performing, how do you explain why all of the DTC marketing eventually end up on advertising on TV? Because they have no choice. They have no choice. They have to go there simply because it's where their shareholders expect them to go. It's also where I believe that it's Dynascore, by the way, D-Y-N-A score. Pretty amazing technology. It's amazing. So I think, tele no, don't get me wrong. I think telly has its space and its place. But once the darlings have fallen out of in touch and in love with all the things they've done in their social currency, they're still going to have to act like a real marketer. Guess what? Television is one of those real marketing channels. So is outdoor, by the way. So is print. So is radio. All of those things are still channels that you're going to want to participate in because they add some value, not all the value, in my humble opinion. Um, but but I don't have a TV, so I don't care about that. However, people still apparently do. But by the way, are those DTC ads actually occupying time where people are really spending time on broadcast? Probably not. They're probably not advertising on Fox News unless they're American Pillow or something. So I, it, it all depends on, on the context of it as well. And by the way, the other thing about that is that uh, infomercial, so you know, long-form infomercial-style ads are very inexpensive depending on the day part. And if you've got a product that is a DM style product or DR style product, then those infomercials probably work really well for people that are, you know, that haven't cottoned on to the, you know, their own uh, OTT space <laughs> on demand and they're watching a bit of broadcast and the, and the rates are inexpensive. So it's probably a channel that they could advertise in. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Do you have uh, a TV? Our... Regina, do you have a TV? We do. I have a TV, yes. You watch mm -hmm. ads still or no? No, I think probably most everything we watch is streaming. 
Yeah. So those, let me be direct. Those D2C brands have to act like a traditional advertiser to actually understand what it's like to, to have a full rounded 360 marketing experience, I guess. And, you know, they also have to understand that sleeping on a mattress for a hundred days and returning that, the cost of that is absolutely enormous. And they're trying to understand how to do different channel marketing, I guess, and things they haven't done before because their cap costs just went right up their mm. cost of acquisition, you know, so they have to think more 360, I think. Okay. All right. So in our last minute, what are oh. your, your last, I don't know, top three things that we should walk away and know today? Okay. So brand position matters, obviously, okay. more than any ever before. Create a dialogue of some kind, which I would call a designer log. So stack and rack all the things that come together. And if somebody touched this typography in that beautiful headline and somebody touched that amazing video sequence or somebody saw that image that they could collect that together and say, yeah, that feels like brand DNA. That's where I would love one thing to get right because there's so many places you can put stuff on channels, but getting it together so it feels like it all comes from the same sort of place and it's being rehacked by itself, that's incredibly powerful in my mind. Also, any technology you're using, make sure it has the human truth at the center of it. If it's helping humans move forward because it's more efficient, fast, more skilled than you are at writing or whatever, in Regina's example, utilize them. Utilize those tools, but make sure the human's at the core of it. Be reflective of culture. So if you can reflect that culture back as your marketing, it feels authentic in that quote unquote word, then it's going to come off as something that's valuable from you and to you and for you. And people are going to want that more. So hand, you know, understand what people's values are and reflect them as your own if they're true to you. And if they're not true to you, that's where transformation of that brand that you represent is going to have to happen at the core of that brand because you cannot out advertise your way out of this business today, in my opinion. Is that helpful? It was extremely helpful. And I want to thank you for your time today. I enjoyed talking to you. Um, you. I always do. It's always such a pleasure. And I want to thank our students and our alumni and our faculty and staff that joined us. So do I. I'm around, guys, if you want to hang out. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'll find you on the interwebs. (laughs) Yes, exactly. On Instagram. (laughs) Apparently. (laughs) Only, yes. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Regina. This has been a blast. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.